By the mid-1800s, populous cities in the American Northeast feared diseases like cholera. To prevent outbreaks thought to originate with deadly odors, cities opened communal baths, some built directly into rivers. These public pools were open to everyone, regardless of ethnicity or race. But as the nation embraced recreational swimming in the early 1900s, African Americans found themselves pushed out of the water from coast to coast as the best pools and beaches became whites-only spaces. This is the story of how African Americans conquered the frontier of recreational swimming to get back into the pool. As northern cities built their first pools, the South was recovering from the Civil War. African Americans expected social transformation, but remained trapped in poverty by a new and repressive system denying them equal treatment. Jim Crow Seeking opportunity, roughly two million African Americans moved north and west between 1910 and 1940. They had come looking for opportunity, but African Americans were confined to poor quality housing and low status work as laborers or domestic servants. They were attacked by working class whites who saw them as competition. Racial conflict spiraled into mass events of white on black violence with the summer of 1919, so bloody it was called Red Summer. Chicago's Red Summer Riot began on July 27th when a teenager was stoned and drowned after entering the white section of the 29th Street Beach. White on black violence convulsed the city for days. By the time state guardsmen regained control of the city, almost 40 people had been killed, 500 more were injured, and thousands were left homeless. Northern attitudes towards African Americans now resembled those in the South. Increasingly, recreational swimming amenities were reserved for whites. Even in the North, African Americans swam on the margins. In the 1920s, cities built large, resort-like pools to serve as recreation for the entire family. But as white swimming surged, discriminatory laws and the threat of violence curtailed African Americans' access to swimming amenities. The 1929 stock market crash ended the Roaring Twenties. But as the federal government put the unemployed to work on infrastructure projects, spending on parks, pools, and beaches soared. From 1933 to 1938, the government built roughly 750 pools and renovated many more. A small fraction of pool building benefited African Americans, who were paying taxes for expensive improvements they could not use. But with most New Deal era beaches, lakes, rivers, and pools considered white space, African Americans were locked out of swimming from sea to shining sea. African American children with no swimming access cooled off in canals and ornamental fountains during hot summers. Jim Crow laws and the threat of violence kept them out of the pool. A separate but unequal investment in swimming instruction meant African American children drowned at higher rates than white peers. Swimming exclusion was not just unfair, it was unsafe. During the Second World War, African Americans linked segregation and lynching with Hitler's ideology. African Americans pushed for pool integration, but whites responded violently. In June of 1949, St. Louis, Missouri desegregated city pools, including Fairgrounds Pool. African American swimmers were attacked by a mob of armed whites that swelled to thousands. The pool closed. Court victories were breaking segregation down, but African Americans remained outside the pool, looking in. In 1954, the NAACP took two cases to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit. Lonesome v. Maxwell showed the risks of segregated swimming. Buddy Lonesome, an African American child, drowned while swimming with an interracial friend group in the Patapsco River, the only place they could swim together. The judge reversed earlier rulings. The nation's public pools would reintegrate at last. Previously, Baltimore City offered six large outdoor pools for whites, but one small pool in Jude Hill Park for African Americans who swam in shifts. On June 23, 1956, Baltimore's public pools integrated. 
In the first year they integrated the pools, I was at the number one pool where we couldn't swim all our lives. I was the, the first fem black female uh, lifeguard that they had in 1956. That's the year they integrated the, the pools. Even as a lifeguard, um, I know that a lot of the white people didn't come anymore. As African Americans waded into public waters, white Americans retreated. From 1950 to 1999, the number of private pools increased from 2,500 to 4 million. Private swimming excluded African Americans and others deemed socially inferior. Youth swim lessons went private too. In the 1950s, new leaders like Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. explained to white Americans what life was like under segregation and why it should end. I could not use uh, the swimming pool. So that, uh, for a long, long time, I could not go in swimming until uh, the YMCA was built, a Negro YMCA, and they had a swimming pool there. But certainly a Negro child in Atlanta could not go to any public park. A lunch counter sit-in at a segregated Woolworths in Greensboro, North Carolina, in February of 1960, proved the value of nonviolent direct action. Activists nationally were sitting in, standing in, and kneeling in, but they were also swimming in and wading in at pools and beaches. In 1964, King and other members of the Southern Christian Leadership Congress traveled to St. Augustine, Florida to support the civil rights campaign being waged there. King would call St. Augustine the most lawless community he had encountered. King first tried to integrate the Monsaw Motor Lodge's whites-only dining room in St. Augustine. King was arrested. From jail, he called for support from American rabbis. A week later, protesters led a swim-in at the lodge pool while rabbis prayed. Incensed, the lodge manager poured acid into the pool. He also attacked the rabbis. The swimmers and rabbis were arrested. Days later, civil rights protesters waiting in at St. Augustine's whites-only beach were confronted by segregationists holding sticks. The events in St. Augustine made the papers nationally. The following week, the Civil Rights Act was signed into law on July 2, 1964, by President Lyndon Johnson, who specifically mentioned the events of St. Augustine as a motivating factor. White retreat from public swimming left large cities swimming deprived. Summer heat made inner-city life intolerable, sparking urban riots. July 12, 1966, teenagers opened a hydrant on Chicago's west side, police closed it, and a crowd gathered. Rumors of police brutality and mass hydrant closures triggered a three-day riot. In response, the federal government funded a new wave of urban pool building. These pools weren't resort-like. The 1960s pools were small and often lacked basic amenities, like changing rooms. Investment in public swimming was short-lived. Of the 70 pools opened in New York City between 1966 and 1971, all but 23 had closed by 1994. The luxurious public pools of the 1920s had come to an inglorious end. Depleted investment in publicly funded swimming and swimming instruction became the twin legacies of segregated swimming. The tragic result was consistently higher rates of drowning for African Americans. After a lifetime of teaching physical education, Miss Scott worries about access to recreational sports. Baltimore City as such needs more recreational facilities. The ones that were there, so many of them are gone, and there are no, there's no place for the kids to play and learn sports. Recognizing the risk of unequal access to swimming, the nation is reconsidering swimming access and education. Public pools closed in the 1980s and 1990s are reopening to serve communities. Jim Crow era African American pools and beaches are recognized as historic sites with educational and social value. And elite African American competitive swimmers demonstrate for a new generation that everyone belongs in the water.